the final of the presidential debates took place today in the United States. I think Barack Obama won it and won it relatively easily. It is incredible the spin that always comes out of these things and it seems that even though Barack Obama beat Mitt Romney multiple times on multiple points and Mitt Romney spent most of the debate on anything substantive saying that he agreed with Barack Obama, that unbelievably people have believed that he passed the commander-in-chief test. I don't quite know what that means. I'm assuming it means he's not a nutter who will start a war. Well, remember, back in the year 2000, George W. Bush said that he didn't want to go on an exercise of nation-building. At the very same debate, in the very same settings, before he became president, basically, he made it very clear that he wouldn't do anything like Iraq or Afghanistan. But then September 11 changed everything and we were off to a double-fronted war. But that's not my focus at the start of tonight's show. We mentioned this towards the end of last night's show and I think there's something really in it. Surely we have hit the time in our democracy where we need an independent panel like the United States to work out our election debates. Currently it's a mess and basically it's up to the Prime Minister to decide exactly when the debate will happen and how many of those debates will take place. Now, Kevin Rudd, early in his prime ministership, did promise some sort of a debates commission like the United States, but like many of those promises made, that's all been swept to one side. But I honestly don't understand how media organisations and the Canberra Press Gallery allow our politicians to get away with such a poor effort when it comes to debates. Basically, in this country, we're, we've been conditioned into one debate amongst the prime minister and the alternative prime minister, and that debate normally happens on the first Sunday night of the election campaign. It seems extraordinary to me that literally, when so much is on the line, that we only demand one hour of our leader's time one week into a five-week campaign. It's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to put more pressure on the leaders and it's time to take the decision away from them. Why wouldn't politicians want to spend as little time in front of a camera as possible? What they want to do is, of course, control the message. They want to have press conferences, they want to have staged events, and they want, essentially, the substance to go out the window. And apart from the campaign launch, all that really happens is that you get a series of people who are in marginal seats nodding behind the said leader, and then we do eventually get that one debate. But it's not good enough. It is time for us to step up. It is time for us to change the system. And the pressure is on. The people in Canberra who are watching us, start pushing the politicians. I know the National Press Club has some involvement in all this, but our current system is not good enough. I need to know, and I want to know, that the Prime Minister is up to it. That the Prime Minister, either this one or the potential future one, knows what they are talking about. Not just can survive 33 days without falling over. We should demand more of the people who want to run our country and thus hold them accountable to the things that they say. What do you think? The hashtag PM Live email, pmlive at skynews.com.au. The stakes are high and we deserve an hour with no spin, no journalists, no interviews, just two people going at it. I think the consequences of what happens in the United States clearly matters to us. So, and when they're talking about foreign policy, it particularly matters to us because if one of them wants to run off to a war, we will be going with them. Now, a couple of exchanges that are worth looking at here before we get into the winner and loser. The question about Russia. Just how significant is Russia as a threat to the United States? Well, uh, Barack Obama has been using this as an attack line on Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney tried to explain himself in the debate today, a debate that, as I said at the start of the show, I did think that he lost. But here is Mitt Romney and Barack Obama in Florida earlier today. A few months ago, when you were asked what's the biggest geopolitical threat facing America, you said Russia. Not Al-Qaeda, you said Russia. In the 1980s are now calling to ask for their foreign policy back because you know, the Cold War has been over for 20 years. But, Governor, you know, when it comes to our foreign policy, you seem to want to import the foreign policies of the 1980s, just like the social policies of the 1950s and the economic policies of the 1920s. Attacking me is not an agenda. Attacking me is not talking about how we're going to deal with the challenges that exist in the Middle East. Russia does continue to battle us in the UN time and time again. I have clear eyes on this. I'm not going to wear rose-colored glasses when it comes to Russia or Mr. Putin. And I'm certainly not going to say to him, I'll give him more flexibility after the election. A reference to a conversation with the then Russian president that was caught on microphone at a, at a recent international forum. I think probably the best line that came out of the debate was when I think Barack Obama put uh, Mitt Romney right on his backside when talking about the size of the American Navy. 
now than any time since 1917. The Navy said they needed 313 ships to carry out their mission. We're now down to 285. We're headed down to the, to the low 200s if we go through with sequestration. That's unacceptable to me. I want to make sure that we have the ships that are required by our Navy. So you, you mentioned the Navy, for example, and that we have fewer ships than we did in 1916. Well, Governor, we also have fewer horses and bayonets because the nature of our military has changed. We have these things called aircraft carriers where planes land on them. We have these ships that go underwater, nuclear submarines. And so the question is not uh, a game of battleship where we're counting ships. It's, it's what are our capabilities? And so when I sit down with the Secretary of the Navy and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we determine how are we going to be best able to meet all of our defense needs. I would like to play now the part of Barack Obama's inner voice after that moment. Nailed it. Um, but was he condescending during this debate? Yes. Because that seemed to be the ultimate pushback of people who wanted to say, OK, he might have won on points, but he was fairly arrogant. Troy? Uh, no, I think, I think he was very strong. He was clearly very comfortable. It was a much more punchier performance. His lines were very sharp. Uh, there were some, some comments on Twitter that Mitt Romney had some you know, sweat beating on his, on his brow. I, th I think that was, he was under a lot more pressure than he has been in previous debates. It, interestingly, you know, the, the, the language of these things are really important, not only in terms of the audience, but also in terms of the opponent. So you know, Barack Obama often said, you know, as Commander-in-Chief, I've made these decisions, or as President, I'm faced with these tough choices. And that's just to remind the audience that he's the incumbent, he's dealing with these issues uh, every day. But I thought, he was, I thought he was pretty strong on those points you raised there, but also on, on the Bin Laden thing. I mean, he, he, he captured Bin Laden. Bin Laden uh, and Bin Laden's being killed, whereas George Bush wasn't able to do that. And, and, and that is a signature, that is his signature foreign policy achievement. But I, I, I heard you quickly there, Gary, saying that, yeah, he was arrogant in this debate today. Yeah, well, look, it had that look about it. I mean, looked impatient. It's sort of like, how, you know, hey, what time is it? Come on, hurry up. Just make me president again. I mean, the reality is uh, the democracy is in the hands of the people and it kind of gets in the way of your career if you're not careful. So that's where he has to be very, very careful. Look, he was part right and part wrong. I think the other point here is that Romney is also part right and part wrong. Russia will play a significant uh, geopolitical role in the, the next uh, number of decades, as it has in the previous number of decades. Why, Paul? Because they call them the BRIC economy. Brazil, Russia, India, China. They're the emerging economic strengths of the world. America is in decline. And that's a reality that I think neither of the candidates have actually offered to the American people, that, hey, we might be this big, massive, robust economy. Have I tautologized myself? I'm sorry. But the reality is that Brazil, Russia, India and China are in big growth and they're going to have big control of the world in the years ahead. But also, too, I mean, the, the, the question of China was dealt with, but they're far harsher in rhetoric about other things in the world apart from China. Um, what did you get out of today's debate, John? Well, I, th I, thought, I thought Barack Obama emerged the winner, like most commentators, but by a narrow margin. I thought he looked more presidential, but the di there's not much of a difference between the two of them, and Romney seems yeah. to have abandoned a lot of his much harsher rhetoric, and it seems in so many areas he's reverting to what we know him to be, his whole history. He's a very moderate member of the Republican Party. A lot of the Republicans don't like him anyway, and you look at it and you think, well, if he won the election, would anything be much different at all? What was interesting, though, and that's what I mentioned at the start of the show, is, is that, you know, George Bush in 2000, when he was up against Al Gore, was saying, I'm not going to be nation-building man. Remember that he was considered to be too isolationist. Now, September 11 happened. It's not a small event. It was a, a moment that ripped history, turned things in a different direction. But I think that when we are only two weeks out from an election, when you're the bloke who is oh so close to becoming president, you're just trying not to scare the horses. So to me, what seems bizarre is that Mitt Romney can present himself as the moderate in order to get there, but Tea Party Congress, uh, Paul Ryan, Vice President, and, and basically a bloke who, it, it, in my view, one of the reasons I don't like Mitt Romney, and I don't know why I think this is more exclusive to him than Barack Obama or any other politician, I think that he is overtly saying anything to capture any ground to get there because I think he covets the job rather than will be good at it. Gee, so there's a lot you could put into that category. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting argument because uh, we, we, really, we really won't know, and that's one of the problems. He has shifted his ground. He has looked a lot more moderate, but then there are all these forces behind him. So you could make an argument, what sort of president would he be? And that's why I think this, this whole strategy, it just looks too wishy-washy. But, but, but also to me, Gary, what, what I found quite bizarre was, and immediately... 
it's this strange thing where clearly you know, tens of millions of people in the United States watch that 90 minutes and then the vast majority will disappear and won't watch the spin that goes after it. But immediately, if you watch that hour that immediately follows after while everyone's frantically trying to work out what's the narrative going to be, who was the winner, let's all call the winner first. What I found interesting as a line from those that were supporting Mitt Romney was that he passed the commander in chief test. And also that he was a calm presence because people are always worried if you get the chance to look at a president this close, you want to make sure that he's not nuts and he's going to push the button. I don't think anyone was afraid of that with Mitt Romney, were they? That this bloke was so crazy that on day one he's going to bomb away half of the world. Yeah, well, I, I think that is actually mission accomplished for, for Romney. Look, I'm no fan of either of them for both, uh, for different reasons, for each of them. And so they both kind of worry me for different reasons. But look, mm. bottom line here is it's going to come down to the hip pocket nerve. Everything I'm hearing out of America is that four years on, that uh, Obama has not lived up to the promise. And, and Paul, look, let's speak very, very plainly here. Uh, the, America has got the sort of the black hurdle out of their system. They're not worried about voting for a man of colour, which is a great thing. It's good that America has grown up to that extent. So now they're looking for a competent president, not necessarily, if you like, uh, the, the sort of statement president. So a boring election campaign in America kind of suits Mitt Romney, because if the get out the vote isn't there, if there's no urgency about Obama as there was four years ago, he'll be in a bit of trouble. Now, there was always phenomenal analysis that comes out of these things, and uh, just for the record, I had a couple of TVs going in the office, but I will point out that John King on CNN, who is fantastic with numbers and stands in front of the big shiny screen and can make things move around, he showed that, look, it, it all comes down to, and we have known this for a while, but it all comes down to essentially one state, and that's Ohio. If Romney can't win it, he can't get enough votes in the Electoral College to become president. Currently, Obama is five points up. So looks like he's doing well in the firewall place. Yeah. I've got to say, after reading the press, after seeing the momentum, after now Obama winning two out of the three debates, people will still tell you that doesn't matter because of just how dominant Mitt Romney's win was in the first. But I'm going to ask you all to do the impossible two weeks out. Your gut water, your feeling, who will be president in about three weeks' time? Well, I think this is a really interesting question. My, my gut has always been that Barack Obama would win because he has, he has a better on-the-ground on organisational effort and he's the incumbent. So he has some huge advantages. And there are some questions about, about Mitt Romney and, and whether or not he comes across well enough. Now, he dispelled some of that in the first debate mm -hmm. um, and somewhat also in the second debate. Um, but I think the issue here now is that, uh, you know, on, on, on Twitter you, you point out a, a Gallup poll where Romney has a six-point lead and people say, oh, no, no, that can't be right. Um, you know, Barack Obama's going to walk, walk away with this election. Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, there are still some polls that are showing it 50-50. Some are showing Romney's ahead. Some are showing Barack Obama's ahead. The other thing is, um, is on the Electoral College vote, there are different stories there as well. There are some that are showing Romney ahead, some that are showing Obama ahead. With two weeks to go, that's a problem for Obama, I think. Mm. I still think he'll get there, but I think it's very, very close, and this election could turn on the smallest thing now. Well, and, and to me, I think that the question about Libya and all of the truths and distortions that are around that event. It is extraordinary that that, that one moment of insanity uh, becomes a political failure for a president who can turn and say, we ended Iraq, I killed Osama bin Laden. And I think that we live in this age now, Gary, where collectively we all have such a short attention span that when you're looking back at four years, it doesn't really, it almost doesn't matter because the news cycle is obsessed with, all right, what's next, what's next, what's next? And that means mm. if you're the challenger, surely you're able to throw up enough distortion, enough doubt. Do you think in three weeks' time Mitt Romney will be president? Uh, well, he won't be in three weeks' time, but he might be in January. Look, uh, he could be <laughs> president-elect. You're point, quite right. Look, look, mate, uh, I spent a bit of time in Ohio. Look, it's a few years ago now. It's back in 1994, so maybe that automatically is devalued. But, look, it is, uh, it is the place where Madison Avenue uh, sends its products to be tested. It is meant to be middle America. It's the sort of place that's not going to be taking uh, um, a lot of credence from what Washington-based journos tell them or New York-based journos will tell them. If people haven't got jobs in Ohio in the northern area, if they're not able to get their produce sold in the southern area, uh, they're going to vote against Obama. It's as simple as that. And if Obama can't, uh, can't convince those people that what he's done in the last four years is nothing compared to how good it's going to be in the next four, 
he's got a real problem. If Ohio is the swing state, that is uh, where it's all going to come down to, well, Romney may well get there, or hanging Chad may come second. I, I, it's it's going to be close. Yeah, I yeah, think it's going to be very close. I get that feeling that we'll be probably talking about on election night a series of issues that are going to push this beyond just the, the, the first Tuesday in November. All right, put them on the line. Who do you think will be president-elect in three weeks' time, John? I think Obama will win. I think the, uh, the way that things are, particularly when people who, who do the numbers and say that within the states, the numbers, when you look at it, are favouring Obama, unless there's some stumble or something spectacular in the next few weeks. The other thing is the bookmakers, mm. and you follow the money, Bookmakers have still got uh, Obama a pronounced favourite uh, with a couple of weeks to go. Having said that, I think you remember we talked about it here. The bookmakers had uh, Maxine McHugh a short price favourite for the suit of <laughs> Benelon back in 2010 when we were talking for months about how she was gone. Yeah. So, um, so the bookmakers do get it wrong sometimes, but uh, I, think, I think Obama is most likely to win. Look, I've got to stay confident to my prediction that I made at the end of last year, which was that Obama will get there, but... Uh, as Gary says, the, the, the maths is absolutely there for Romney at the moment. It is fascinating to watch at the moment. So I, I think if I have to pick, it's going to be Obama. But I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if, uh, if people just run in the direction of who they think is going to win. And if the Republicans can successfully make that look like Mitt Romney, game over. Now, uh, just before we take a break here, there was a question that I raised at the start of the show about how I think Australia should follow the American model of a debates commission an independent commission of people who set a date, set a subject, set the formats with which our debates work. Because I think it is terrible that in Australia that we have compulsory voting but we only demand one hour of the Prime Minister or alternative Prime Minister to stand in front of the nation with the worm and the rest of us all sitting and judging on. Now, I know there's lots of little things that go around it. I know that we do the town hall forums here at Sky News, but I think it should be three of these damn things because over a five-week campaign, John, mm. if the debate happens in the first week, it doesn't matter who mm. wins. Three of them staged in the style that we just saw there, with the two of them going at each other, mm. particularly if it's Tony Abbott and Julia Gillard, given the present dynamic between the two, it could be fascinating and it would be interesting also to think, because most of this goes down to whoever thinks there's an advantage for them asks for the debate and, and generally the Prime Minister avoids having debates and the opposition leader demands more. And this, on this occasion, I suspect on this occasion it'll be Julia Gillard wanting as many debates as possible and Tony Abbott trying to avoid having as, it, more than one. But my issue is, is that I think that the media has a role to play here to send a very clear message to both of these guys, sorry, this is what we demand. Mm. Uh, rather than just getting on the bus and going around and going from shopping centre to shopping centre, stage to event to stage event. We'll do that, but we demand in return for us slavishly following you around and getting told, you know, at one minute's notice that you're going off to Perth. We'll do that and we'll be your PR agents and tell you what's happening in shopping centres, but you've got to do this for us and by extension our viewers and, and readers. Troy? Uh, absolutely. I'm a big fan of this. I, I, sh I should say that when I worked for Kevin Rudd, I wrote a memo on this and that and that, that was announced during the campaign as by Tim Gartrell, the ALP National Secretary, mm. uh, and Kevin Rudd, that Labor would do this in office and they haven't done it. Um, and it's really disappointing because um, this is about a serious debate, a serious discussion of issues, bring, b brings the public into it, has a structure to it. It's an important part of our democracy and they should do it. But, you know, interestingly, in the United States, of course, there's the famous 1960 uh, Kennedy-Nixon debates. Um, but then there was quite a gap because there was no mm. debate in 64 and because Richard Nixon had generally regarded as being as having lost against um, John F. Kennedy, he refused to have a debate in 68 and 72. So it was between 60 and then there was another gap right up until 76 yeah, that right. there was another debate. Um, but, uh, but that just shows you the politicians don't like this, but as you say, as the public and the media, we should but, demand it. And that's my, that's my thing, Gary. It's got to get out of the politicians' decision-making process because obviously they're always going to run from these things because why wouldn't you be scared witless of needing to know everything three times with all of the dangers that go with it? I say, if you want the job, if you want the title, you've got to do this. Yeah, I've got no problem with it at all, Paul. I, I'm just a sort of an old-fashioned kind of guy and... I actually thought Parliament was there for debates, but of course we know it's not. It's just there to get the uh, the eight second grab up Correct. in the Sadly, in the evening yes. news, uh, and it is a real problem. In fact, frankly, there's more debate that takes place on this channel than any other. Uh, television channel anywhere in Australia and that's great for this channel but it's not really good for our democracy that it's not happening regularly. The sad reality is three years of Parliament should produce three years of solid debate, solid, solid policy alternates. Instead all we've got is name calling and uh, sloganeering and jargoneering and, and it's true on both sides. We need to get leaders who are prepared 
to be so confident about their nation building ambitions of Australia that they are willing to take on all comers anywhere, anytime. You know, see you at street corner here or see you at town hall there or see you in television studio there. Either way, I think you're right. It's got to be done. It's not an American solution. This is actually something desperate our democracy needs to reinvigorate it. And, and, and my view is, is that I don't know how it works in the Canberra press go. I don't know who's actually the one with the heft and all the rest of it. But surely enough people can get together and say, here's the deal. We'll follow you on the bus, but you've got to give us three debates. It's over to you, Gallery. We'll wait and see. We are watching to see what happens here. Remember, it's only every three times a year when they really, really need us. So let's start pushing back on them.